This is a uh, Renko C120 120 horsepower purpose built car engineer. Uh, today's video is about um, the machine care uh, and it's for the operator. Um, we're going to talk about all the tips and tricks, all the things that the operator either needs to do on a daily basis, a weekly basis, but um, really we want to make sure this machine uh, runs every day like it's brand new. We want you know, the most productivity that we can get. And we want this machine to last a good six years. So if you follow this instruction along with uh, Earthborn's um, uh, maintenance program, you, know, you should get good productivity for a long time out of this machine. Uh, my name is Doug Taylor. I'm the owner of Earthborn. Uh, together with uh, Kevin and Evan and uh, the rest of our team, we've been servicing these machines for about 10 years in the field. We've got a few hundred of these machines that are operating every day. Um, it's a really difficult and tough application. You can see the machine is built like a tank, but it, it's purpose built to do clear right away. There's a lot of distribution lines, a lot of transmission lines, but it'll take a steady diet of trees that are up to about eight inches in diameter. So it has a pretty tough life. Um, so one of the things that we've done for most of these units is um, we put them under service plans. Where we come out every three months for five years, 20 visits, where we'll do an inspection on the machine. Uh, we'll look at it. Um, see if uh, it needs anything, we'll do the warranty updates, uh, we'll do the preventative maintenance, we'll do operator training, um, and this video is just part of our operator training for the operator. It can be found on the QR code sticker on the machine. Um, so you'll see every machine has a QR sticker, um, and then every machine binder, uh, service manual that will drop off, you know, has a, a QR sticker. Um, the thing with this is, uh, you will be able to, once you take a picture of that, jump to any part of the video. So if you want to jump right to how you manage the traps or jump to uh, right to how you uh, torque the teeth on the mower head, you know, you'll be able to do that with the video. Um, there's a phone number here. This is the phone number at Earthborn's Uptime Center. Um, our team technicians are ready to take your calls. If you have any issues with the machines, a lot of times we might be able to diagnose something over the phone because we work on these machines every day. This is what we specialize on. This is what we've been doing for 10 years. Um, our team will make arrangements to come out to you in the field um, to do the repairs. Uh, or what we'll do if it's something minor, we'll typically help find a third party repair shop that's local to you, coordinate the whole thing from start to finish. We'll give them the information they need to make Repair, we'll expedite the parts, we'll follow through, we'll make sure the repair was done right, and uh, we'll get the machine up and running as quickly as we can. And next I want to go over the uh, machine binder. This is the binder that we um, give with every new machine. It's also a binder that if you don't have when our technicians come out to do the, um, the quarterly inspections, you know, we can give you another copy of. But let me show you uh, what's in this binder. So first thing to point out is our contacts. So this is the same contact number that is on the QR code in the machine, but this is the main number for any issues you have or any questions about the machine operation. This is our National Uptime Center. Um, this is our, our key person. Uh, this is our administrator here. And then down here is our specialized uh, parts uh, phone number. Um, next, you'll see you've got the QR codes. If you want to take a picture of these, the same as you could in a machine and bring it up. Um, then we've got... Um, two main sections. First, we've got the C120RA and then the C120R. The C120RA is the, um, the newer version of the C120. This is with the Cummins Tier 4 engine. And the C120R is the previous version with the Caterpillar um, Tier 4 engine. So let me show you what's in here. These are all the common things that um, you're going to need on a regular basis to, you know, care for this machine. Uh, specifically, uh, we put in um, things like the component locations, um, how to check your fluid levels, how to transfer hydraulic fluid into the machine, how to lubricate the machine, how much grease it takes, how many pumps of grease you take for each location and how often you grease. Shows you here how to adjust the tracks. how to work with the death tank, how to operate the machine, how to warm up the machine. There's your cold starting operation. Here's all your buttons and controls. An awful lot of information here to 
really give you everything that, you know, from the many years that we've been working on this, the key information that you need to care for the machine and to operate the machine. Towards the end here, you've got charts that show you um, your fluids, um, your lubricants, your capacities, what type of fluid goes in the antifreeze, what type of engine oil, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, machine specifications, uh, weights, torque, things like that. This whole section is a, is a repeat. This is everything for the uh, Caterpillar version. Same thing, adjusting tracks, all your grease fittings, all your fluids, lubricants, and capacities. Um, then we get into what I think is really, you know, the most important part of the book. So this is your, your daily maintenance. Um, I'll show you these two pages here. We have um, one that is for um, the pre-operation morning walk-around checklist, and then one that's for the, uh, the end of the day. Um, the three times you really look at the machine is, is first in the beginning of the day, you know, while it's cold. Uh, then we do some work uh, at lunchtime, uh, and then we do a, a cleanup and a prep for the following day. But what you'll find is uh, these here, this is the front page, this is the back page, as you can see, front and back. Uh, there will be 52 of these sheets in your binders, you know, one for each week. Um, you go through and you mark it off Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and you, this video you'll find is, is an exact duplicate of, of what this is. You know, We're going to go right to um, starting the machine and the warm-up procedure. Um, and then uh, later we're going to go to you know, checking the machine over for leaks. But each one of these lines on here, this video will show, you know, how and what we'd like you to do on each one of these lines. So the machine continues to run as productively as possible for as long as possible. So 52 of these, um, when we come out um, every three months, uh, we'll go over this together. If you have questions, uh, we'll train you exactly what to be looking for and how to be doing these things. Um, the next page after that. This is our, our, our maintenance log. So when we come out and we change the fluids and the filters and do other maintenance on the machine, we'll, we'll log it in the book. If you guys have to do anything between our visits, you know, any major repairs, let's get it logged in this book. Having a good history, we found, is, is really important on these machines so that we can keep the cost of ownership as, as low as possible and not duplicate any things. Then we have a, a part section. Part section shows the common parts. This shows all of the service parts, um, uh, specifically your teeth and your teeth part numbers and your bolts and your nuts and your hardware. This shows all of the uh, filters uh, for the Caterpillar machine. Um, and then this shows you all the filters for the Cummins machine. And this shows you some other common wear item and replacement parts. So you've got your parts detail there, more replacement parts. Um, We've got some information then on the mower head. There's two mower heads that we primarily run on these machines. The first one uh, is on the new machine that we have here today. That's the Rayco Predator head. And then Rayco, they're also the manufacturers of Dennis Seamoff. So the used machine we have here today to show you, that one has the Dennis Seamoff. But this here is the information for the Rayco head. So this shows you exactly how to replace your teeth, you know, when to change out your hardware, uh, what your torque specifications are. Again, all stuff that we're going to go over today. This shows you on the Rayco head how to check the adjustment of your uh, poly drive belts and um, how to make the adjustments to your poly drive belts and what kind of tools and everything that you're going to need. Uh, and then here is the Dennis Seamoff head. So all the same information, how to adjust the belts, how to manage your teeth, but all that is, is in this book. So the book is, is a great reference, um, and it's something that um, you want to keep with the machine and that you'll you want to basically work with daily as you do your machine care. Right, so uh, when you have one of these machines, um, you definitely have a, a responsibility to um, care for the machine. And, and with that, you, know, you need special tools to care for the machine. Uh, we've got our essential tools here that you're going to use every single day um, that the operator should have. And then we've got some tools over here uh, that show you how to do a lot of the adjustments and how to kind of take things apart that somebody in the crew with the machine should have. But I'll go through some of the essential tools here. The first is a, um, a shovel, uh, a narrow space shovel. You want this shovel so you can get in all the tight spots around the tracks and the undercarriage. You're going to want to clean this machine out every single day so it doesn't accelerate the wear of the tracks. Um, and you want to want to do it at the end of the day um, when the dirt is still loose, it's still wet, and it pushes right out. But even this narrow spade doesn't get to all the tight spots you know, in the undercarriage. So we've got a pry bar here, and this pry bar 
can get in all the tight spots, specifically up around the sprockets. And there's a lot of wear on the sprockets when the sand gets caught up in there. So if you get in there every day and you push that out, then you're not going to have the accelerated wear on the sprockets. Um, the next one is a air compressor. The air compressor here is, and the reason we show it is, is because this is an essential part. You know, with every machine, there should be a support truck that's got an air compressor that's got a lot of power and a lot of air in it because these machines collect a lot of debris every day when they're running. Uh, you can see this is a nice long air, air gun um, so that you can get into all the tight spots in the engine compartment or other spots that are hard to reach. And we've got a rubber tip nozzle here. And the nice thing about the rubber tip nozzle is you can get right into the cooling pack, right into the um, radiator, and you don't have to worry about hurting the coils with the metal tip nozzle. You got a flashlight here, so as you're doing it, you can run your flashlight through, make sure that you've got light all the way through the cooling packs. We used to use uh, leaf blowers. The problem with the leaf blowers is that we never push the debris all the way through and it would get packed in there. So you, you want to have a really good air gun. Um, this is kind of simple, but uh, it's two by four, and this is your best tool to make sure that your track tension is the right track tension so you aren't accelerating wherever it tracks. Uh, we've got a grease gun here. Um, we recommend getting a good grease gun because you're going to grease the machine every day. You're probably going to go through about three tubes of grease on this machine every week. Um, good grease gun like this is invaluable because it gets grease in all the right places. But the warning with this gun is if you use it for the tracks, you got to be careful that you don't over grease the tracks. Only a few pumps is typically all you need, but if you go and you, you pull this trigger and you let it go down too long, you're going to make the tracks too tight and you're going to accelerate the wear. Uh, I also show a, um, a garden hose. Um, the reason I show a garden hose is just another warning. Um, there's a lot of areas in this machine that you got to keep clean. Uh, we do uh, say that the best way to keep it clean is to tilt the cab, to open up the engine compartment, to use a pressure washer, but be careful when you use a pressure washer. Uh, the reason is, is there's a lot of electrical components in there. Um, so. Sometimes we'll take a plastic bag and put it over the computer. We always disconnect the battery uh, isolator that we'll show you. But there's some areas in there where you're just going to rinse. You're going to rinse it. You're going to pull the belly pans out. You're going to rinse around it. Um, so keep that in mind that there's some areas that shouldn't be uh, hit with the pressure washer. Uh, over here, we're going to talk about our uh, tools that we need for adjustments that somebody you know in the crew should have. Additional tools you're going to want to have on your support truck is a half inch socket either on an electric impact or on a ratchet for removing the side access plate to your grease fitting. If the tracks were too tight or you need to put a track back on and release the pressure, you'll need a 7 8 socket to run that grease port out. And then as far as your poly drive belt, you're going to need a 9 16 wrench to, for your access plate for checking track tension. And if you needed to tension it, you're going to need this as well to remove the entire side panel. Once in there, you're going to need an inch and an eighth wrench to re loosen the jam nut. And then a 15 16 for the backside of the mower head to actually adjust the belt. You're going to want a torque wrench that goes to at least 220 foot-pounds with a 15-16 socket to install and remove your teeth. You're going to need a wire brush when installing new teeth to clean the faces of the teeth if you were flipping them and the tooth holder itself so they seat properly. We highly recommend a test light so if we were doing diagnostic work over the telephone, we can make sure you have power to those areas so we're not guessing, just looking at a fuse. It'll just make the diagnosis that much easier. And now that we've gone over the tools that we're going to need, we're going to start talking about the checklist that you do in the morning. So every morning you want to make sure that while it's cold, you're looking over a couple things to make sure the machine is ready to work that day. First thing I like to do is I like to do a walk around for leaks. The reason I like to do the walk around for leaks first thing is because the machine's been sitting all night and if it, it's been leaking, you know, you're going to see the drip pattern somewhere around the machine. So I usually start here, I, I look at the mower, I'm looking at the ground around the mower, I'm looking at you know, all my hoses here, 
Uh, this is a potential leak point here where the quick couplers are. If this is leaking, you're going to see some oil down here on the tracks. I'm going to look at the hoses. I'm going to look inside under here. I'm going to look at the cylinders. I'm going to do a really good visual on this machine and make sure that there's you know no leaks you know hydraulically. I'm also kind of kind of look at the lines and make sure there's no frays, nothing that's going to take me out of service during the day. So then I kind of walk around the machine. I'm looking here at the. Uh, final drives and making sure that there's no oil in the inside of the tracks and then I'm looking around the back of the tracks and underneath the tracks to make sure there's no oil under the, the, the tracks. I'm looking up here at the, at the cooling pack. I'm looking at the top of the hood. I'm making sure that there's no oil on the top of the hood. I'm opening up the engine compartment and I'm turning on uh, the light in here and I'm looking around you know inside you know of the machine make sure that I'm not seeing you know any leaks. I might have my, my flashlight um, or some of these machines have a light uh, so you can see up in there. Coming around the back, I'm looking around the back of the machine to make sure there's no drips. Looking over here on the top of the hood, making sure there's nothing. Opening up the engine compartment here. Here's the light I was talking about. Lights on a magnet. So you can kind of get in here, make sure there's no leaks, you know, inside your, your engine compartment. And then around and doing the same thing here, making sure that there's no leaks. Every morning before you get going for the day, you want to check your fluids. Um, we'll show you how to check the fluids on the Cummins. Uh, Cummins is the red engine. Um, and the Caterpillar, and the Caterpillar is the yellow engine. So first we'll talk about the Cummins, so we're going to show you how to check your engine oil, uh, check your coolant, and check your hydraulics. Now the reason you do this at the beginning of the day is uh, at the end of the day or any other time when the fluids are hot, you're going to get a false reading. So uh, first we've got our, our light here, our work light, um, and you can see right here this red dipstick, this is your engine oil. All right. So you're going to pull your engine oil out, you're going to clean it, and then you're going to put it back in Sure goes all the way down just like that and then you're going to pull it right back out and you're looking here you want to make sure that your fluid level is between this bottom cross hatch and this top cross hatch and you can see this one right here is right where my fingernail is so this machine could use a little bit more engine oil so if that's the case you want to top this off with engine oil okay so you put this back in and this work light's nice because this comes off and this can kind of follow you around to everything else you want to work on in the machine. So your cooling pack, your antifreeze, um, right here is, is where the indicator is. So we actually want to remove the winch. So you come over here, you have a safety clip here, you pull the safety clip out. You have a T-handle here, you pull your T-handle out. As long as that's greased, you come out just that easy. You have a handle here, and your winch pivots up out of the way. And then this wheel comes off of the cooling pack, and you can see right here is your antifreeze. Uh, we got a little bubble at the top, so we can see that uh, the antifreeze level is okay on this machine. Now we go around the other side of the machine for the hydraulic fluid. Hydraulic fluid is a little hidden, but I usually will clean off the window here, and then as you come around here with the light, you can see right there where your hydraulic tank fill level is. And you can see here is your cold fill level. So if you look at that, you can see right where you need to be, you know, with your hydraulic fluid. How to check and how to clean your air filter on your C120 with the red Cummins engine. Air filters up here. Uh, first thing you want to do is make sure this duct bill is clean. Make sure there's no dirt that's kind of stuck here. Um, then you've got the uh, the cover for the filter. We've got the wing nut, you know, mostly off. But you're going to turn the wing nut and you're going to pull your cover off. And then you're just going to do a visual inspection of your filter. You don't want to take the filter out every day. Every time you take it off, you're risking, you know, getting dirt inside of the engine. You just kind of want to 
put your finger in there, move it around, see if any dirt's falling off. If you have a lot of dirt that's falling off and, and falling off to the bottom, you know, then you want to take it off. So here you have another wing nut, same thing. You're going to have to spin this quite a bit to get it out. But if you're going to take the filter out, that's how it comes out. Now, this is just a, a paper filter here, um, and it's difficult to, to get it clean, and, and you have to be really careful with this that as you're cleaning it, you don't do damage. Um, what we find most of the time is that we have engines that get dusted, the dust gets past this engine, it gets in the cylinders, takes the cylinder walls out and piston rings out, is because somebody that was cleaning it was too aggressive with the cleaning, and when they cleaned it, they actually put holes in it. So the first thing you want to do is you never want to clean it here in front of the engine because you've got your engine exposed without uh, the, the primary filter on here, so you don't want to clean it here and have the dust go up into here. So you want to take your filter, and you want to take it as far away from the engine compartment as possible, and you want to tap it. And as you're tapping it, if this is a dirty filter, you know, all your debris is going to kind of fall out of the filter. You have to be careful when you tap it that you don't do any damage to the bottom. Again, we've had guys that have tapped it too hard, damaged the bottom, created all kinds of problems. If you want to use the air compressor, that's fine, but keep in mind that you don't want to be in here trying to clean it because when you do that, that's when you can blow a hole in the paper filter. So what we recommend is put the filter down and from a far distance, you want to kind of blow this way inside out, inside out. And as long as you're blowing this way inside out, you're going to you know, clean the dirt, you know, out through the filter. But again, just be really careful. Don't do any damage. So this is your primary filter. And there's a second filter here. It's called a safety filter. And again, I like to look at it. If it's nice and clean and it's not dirty, um, I just leave it alone. Uh, and I leave it in there just as it is. You want to make sure that that is all the way back, that the rubber seal in the back is, is tight, that your wing nut is, is nice and tight, and then you want to put this one here over the top of it. Make sure it seats all the way back in there. You want to put your wing nut on. Again, for this video, we're not going all the way tight, but you want to get that all the way tight, thread it up, pushed in there really good so it can't move, and then you're going to put your cap back on with your wing nut and screw it all together and make sure it's good and tight and you know, all the way around. This is the lifeblood of your machine. If your air filter's clean, your machine's going to be a lot more productive. It's going to run better. It's going to use less fuel. But this is something that you want to check every day. And you might find, based on how much dust you're working in, you might actually only take the filter out once a week or so. But you got to have a clean filter. Extremely important part of the machine. All right, fluid checks on the Rayco C120s with the Caterpillar. You can tell if it's the Caterpillar, if it's the, uh, the yellow engine opposed to the red engine that's in the Cummins. So kind of same thing. Um, you've got a light here, and you have a light switch that's right here. Well, when you have a light on, that's going to show you your engine oil dipstick. It's on the same side as the Cummins. You can see it right down over here. So that's your dipstick there. Reach in there, pull it out, clean it. Put it back in, make sure it goes all the way to the bottom. Then you're gonna bring it up and you're gonna check your level. And right there you can see where the level is. And the level is right at the minimum here. So this one here needs a little bit more engine oil. So you're gonna to top up your engine oil and then you're gonna check some of your other fluids. One thing that we didn't mention on the, um, the Cummins is the fuel water separator. Um, the Caterpillar has got a glass bowl right here. And you can see as you look into that glass bowl, you can see that that is nice red off-road fuel. Uh, there aren't any indication of any water or any debris in there. If there were, you would turn this valve at the bottom, let the water drain out, and then you'd um, go into the cab and you'd turn the key to run and you'd let the fuel pump pump up fuel back into the filter. And you want to make sure it's filled up before you go and you actually start it and fire it up. Uh, with the Cummins, I would say um, you've got um, no glass bowl, so you just want to kind of open it up once a week. This machine doesn't have the electric fuel pump. It actually has a hand pump right here. So you can pump the hand pump to bring fresh new red fuel up in here 
once you've you know drained this and drained out of the water. So again, you're just going to kind of pump it here. But I think the Cummins has the electric fuel pump. All right, so we'll take this around and we'll go around to the uh, cooling pack. We've already got the winch out of the way, and uh, we have this machine. This machine is um, about 2,500 hours. Uh, we didn't clean it up. We wanted to show you where some of the debris and everything collects, so it is a dirty machine, but um, this does have the Caterpillar engine. So this Caterpillar engine does not have a sight gauge you know, like the um, Cummins engine has. All it has is it has a cap here on the, on the radiator, and again, this is why you, you do it when it's cool, so this is under pressure and you don't have the steam in there. But you're just going to pull the cap off, and you're going to take your light, and you're going to look down in there and just make sure that you've got fluid to the top of it and then put your cap back on real good. And then as we go around to the other side, just like with the Cummins engine, um, I'm gonna show you the hydraulic. And the hydraulic you'll see is in the exact same spot as the hydraulic fluid level check on the Cummins. And it's right up here. And again, you wanna check that when it's cold and you can see right here is the cold level, and then this one here is actually too low. If you check it when it's hot, you know, the fluid level is gonna be, you know, almost to the top. All right, so that's how you check the uh, hydraulic level. So on the Caterpillar, the air filter is, is right back here on top of the radiator. Um, same thing, uh, with the cover on, you wanna open up the ductville, see if there's any dirt there, and there you go, you have dirt and leaves fall out of this dirty machine. You have these three clips. You have one on the back, one here on the side, and one here on the top. And you can see the top of this says so top. This is important when you go to try to put it back together. I'm going to pull this off, and you can see this is a pretty dirty filter. So again, I like to just kind of tap it and see if any dirt falls out. And you can see plenty of dirt that's falling out here as I tap it. So we know that this filter is probably do for a cleaning. Um, so we'll take this out. I'll give it a little twist. There's no wing nut on these. And try to bring it out slowly. Okay, we can see here this is your primary filter, your safety filter. I'm looking at this one and this one looks pretty clean right now. We don't have any dirt on there. Uh, we always put on the hours and the date that the filters were changed. You can see this one was changed on 523 with 2044 hours. And this one was on 623 at 2044 hours. Actually, I guess that's a six. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna take this around to a spot where it's safe. And we're just gonna tap it. And we're gonna let all the dirt come out. And we're gonna tap it lightly because we don't wanna damage this bottom. Uh, that we don't wanna tear any holes here, allowing the um, the, the dirt to get through the filter. Just want to keep tapping it until it's clean. And again, this isn't something you have to do every day, but probably something you want to probably do once a week. You can see we're getting a lot of the dirt out. If it's exceptionally dirty, again, you can get your air gun and you want to blow from the inside out. Once this is clean, and this could be a little bit more clean than this is, but once it's clean, then you can come back around and put it back in. If this inside filter was dirty, what I like to do is we actually can take this off. A magnet here. We can take this out. But when we take this out, We've got our engine exposed, so we want to make sure that we at least put the primary back in so no dirt gets in there as we're working on it. Same thing, we'll take this around in the front of the machine, we'll tap it out, we'll clean it, um, and then we'll put this back in. But you can see here, um, this just kind of squeezes up on, and this, this seal here is what seals it. But any dirt that gets around here is what could destroy your engine. So the air filters are such an important part to make sure that you know, you're keeping after. So primary. You want to get this seal all the way in. So you're going to push it in and you're going to kind of twist it in place. And then your larger filter here, same thing, twist it in place. 
Then you've got your cap. This is your top. You want to make sure all your clips are, are back and out of the way. And the lock's in there. That's top. It goes a little bit of an angle at the bottom. When you have it in the right spot, you're going to get good engagement with your clips. You'll know it when all three of them are, are in there good. If they're not in there good, then you, your filter's going to get clogged much faster. So you have it in there good. You make sure it's all tight. Make sure it's all lined. Take a quick visual on it, and you should have it in good shape. All right, in the mornings, guys, you want to do just a quick walk around, make sure that um, there's no new damage, you know, from the day before that maybe you missed. You're going to look at your teeth. You're going to run the, the smaller head around. You're going to make sure all your, your teeth are there. Uh, none of them are damaged. You're going to go around the machine. You can see some, there's some bent metal up here. If it's new damage, you want to know that. You're going to look at your hydraulic hoses, you're going to look at your tracks and cuts, you're going to look at your, your windows. And the reason we're looking at this one is because this machine's you know, got some time on it. And we're going to look for you know, any dents or broken areas. You can see this machine got, got hit here. Um, you can see it looks like it got backed into something here at the tank, but it's supposed to go through some damage. So you're just going to kind of walk around and make sure that there's, any, there's not any new fresh damage. Here you can see that the, the pre filter has got a hole in it, um, and that's going to cause um, uh, and allow the air filter to get clogged up faster because some bigger leaves and some bigger material can get through. Go through, check the track, make sure there's no new cuts, uh, but you're going to note any additional damage that wasn't there the day before. Walk around and, and check to make sure that all your safety decals are on the machine, all your guards and shields, uh, and your fire extinguisher is. is there, it's accessible and ready to go. So I'll do a quick walk around. I'm not going to hit all the decals or, or all the safety guards, but I'll show you a few. Uh, first, you've got this door here. Make sure that nothing is obstructing your door so you get your door open and closed on your mower head. Um, here on the back, you can kind of see down below the chains. So you want to lift the head up and you want to make sure that your deflecting chains are, are there and hang low. Um, on the mower head, uh, you have a, uh, a safety bar here. Um, this red safety bar, you want to make sure this is here with these bolts on it. That's going to keep your attachment plate locked to keep your mower from coming off. Um, you're going to see uh, a handful of decals. Um, definitely want to make sure your stay back 300 feet is here. There's a couple more and a couple of other decals of you know, where to keep clear when it's operation. If you look inside the cab, you're going to see the fire extinguisher right here. So as soon as you go to the cab, it's immediately to the right. So the reason I put it there is so you can get right in and you can grab it uh, and you can remove it. Um, so before you start the day, you want to make sure you don't have anything kind of in the way here. So you can make sure the fire extinguisher is accessible. And you want to check the tag on it too. You want to make sure that that, that uh, fire extinguisher is not expired and that it is charged and it is ready to go. Uh, coming around this side over here, you can see this is where you put your fire extinguisher. You put your nozzle in here in case you have an engine fire, and then you exhaust your fire extinguisher into the engine. You don't want to open the door because when you open the door, you fuel the fire, you know, with you know fresh oxygen. Um, so when you're using the fire extinguisher, you just want to put it here and you want to blow inside. Uh, as you walk around the back of the machine, you're going to see some other uh, safety items. You've got some deflector chains down here. They want to make sure that it's all there, it's all the way across, it's hanging, it's not twisted, it's not bent, it's not missing. Um, and you want to make sure that's there so that will deflect any material that's shooting from the mower underneath the machine. You want to make sure your, your hook is on, you're ready to go. Uh, here's a good factory swedge. You want to make sure you've got a good factory swedge. Uh, you've got more safety decals, another one that stay back 300 feet. You have another fireplace port right here, fire extinguisher port. You want to make sure that your safety struts are here. You have a safety strut for when the cab is up in the air, so you can work under the cab without worrying about it coming down. You have another safety strut here. You put this safety strut on your loader arm when you have your loader arm up in the air, so you can work underneath your loader without worrying about that coming down. You've got some more safety decals inside. You've got some safety decals here that tells you the machine height. More safety decals 
Um, but yeah, you want to go around the machine, make sure that all your safety decals didn't get torn off the day before and then it's ready to go for another day. As part of the morning safety inspection, you want to check the cab. And the cab has been graded for, for rollovers, it's graded to have the branches and debris fall on it. So you want to make sure everything is okay from the day before. The reason we say don't do this in the evening is a lot of times it's dark in the evening, you have better light in the morning, so we want to make sure we do it as part of the day. So you're going to kind of look over the cab and take a really good look at you know, some of the, the, the strength points of the cab. And there's a heavy, there's a whole lot of steel on this. This is a really heavy duty, fantastic safe cab. But you're going to look at it, make sure you don't have any cracks in the weld, you don't have anything bent, you don't have anything twisted, and everything looks good. You're not only going to do this corner, but you're going to do the other corner, you're going to do the back, and you're going to take a really good visual on it. And if there's any issues, you know, you're going to take the machine out of service and not run it if the cab is compromised. Then you're going to look at all your windows. Most of the windows on this machine is a safety Lexan. It's, it's built for debris falling against it and flying and hitting it. So you're going to look at this and you're going to make sure that there's no cracks. And again, we're looking at a machine with uh, a couple thousand hours plus on it so you can see a machine that's really been through, you know, the war in the woods. Um, you're going to take a really good visual on it. You're going to make sure there's no cracks, there's no holes, you know, that it's just these surface scratches that you see here. Um, so you're going to take a look at all your side pieces, you know, make sure there's nothing more that prevents some scratches, um, and make sure there's no uh, cracks or cuts. Now, then you're going to go in the machine, and uh, while we're talking about glass, we want to do a safety inspection. So one of the advantages of this machine, and one of the reasons we keep saying it's purpose-built, is it's built for mowing. It mows all day long, every single day. Um, and um, part of having it being built for mowing is so that it has all these safety features. The first safety feature is you saw that I just got in and out of the door. So instead of having to climb out over top of the hot mower or mower running, you get out of the door where it's, 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 it's off and, and away from the mower. But let's say you rolled over and you were rolled over on this door, you'd still have two extra escape areas. You have this one area here and you have this one area here. Now you want to make sure that when you need these, that these windows will open. You know, sometimes um, if you roll over, uh, these might be jammed because you may have never tested these. So we always like to just kind of move these handles back and forth. You can see there's three of them. Make sure that when you need them, they're going to work. So you do it on the side. And then same thing with the safety hatch, you know, on the roof. Um, this one here, you've got these handles and you got three handles. And I usually like to take these and open them up all the way. And I like to push this up and out and make sure it's not jammed. Now, this I'll do uh, all the time except for really cold temperatures. And really cold temperatures, when you do that with the rubber seal, you'll actually tear the seal and you could have a leaking roof. So I really only like to do that um, you know, in, in normal temperatures. And then you want to make sure you tighten it back up and you put it all back together and it's good and secure and then while you're in here same things you want to kind of look at the rops and pop structure the interior steel of the machine make sure there's no no cracks or uh, no broken welds or anything like that on the inside just take a couple minutes but when you do it then you know in case you really do find yourself in a bad spot you'll be able to get out of the machine in case you need to properly check um, your mower head belt so you want to remove the 916s, take the cover out, okay, then you got your poly belt here, you just want to take one finger, push down, you want to see about three quarters of an inch of movement. Now this needs to be done cold, uh, you don't want to do it when it's hot because the pulleys expand and it makes the belt tighter. Also why I have this cover off I usually look in here, look at my pulleys, um, look at my grease hose, make sure nothing's going on out of the unusual. Um, this you need to do once a week. Um, you don't want this thing too tight because if it's too tight, it puts a load on the bearings. And you also, if it's too tight, you'll hear a whining. So it kind of gives you an indication. If it's too loose, it could jump the cogs, damage the belt and put you out of service. It's real important that you check this once a week. Like I said, just push down on it. You don't have to kill it. About three quarters of an inch. I'm going to 
demonstrate um, how to do a Devin Seamoth head. The one I showed you earlier was for the Rayco head. Um, this one is a little different. You don't have that access panel. You have to take out these bolts. Okay, this thing opens up. With this one, it's a little different. You want to make sure that the breeze is not in here. Clean all this out. Um, same thing, about three quarters of an inch of deflection. Uh, but it's basically the same. You just want to look around too while you're in here. Make sure everything's good. Nothing's starting to fail. Um, real simple. To adjust it, you can see on this one, it's the same thing on the Rayco head, but there's four bolts here. Okay, you got a jam nut up here and your adjusting nut. You just turn this in or out, whether you need to loosen it or tension it. Okay, very simple procedure. We're going to be going over some of the switches that you're going to be using daily. Uh, first thing that you want to do when you enter the cab is you want to put your seat belt on. You want to have your armrest completely down. You want to have your door shut. Nothing will work if this is up or if your door is open. Over here we have your wiper controls. What we say to do is before you hit that to hit your wiper fluid so the windshield is wet. If you do not do that and you run this dry, you will scratch the Lexan. You have your throttle up, down. You want to keep the machine in super flow while mowing. You have winch out, winch in. These are your lights. This is your parking brake. Before you start Immediately after you start the engine, you want to put your parking brake on. So if you were to get out of the machine and someone was next to the machine, if you hit this, the machine is live, you can hit them. These are all your HVAC controls. This is your radio up here. We do not recommend you have this on while mowing so you can hear the engine or any bystanders. Over here is your display screen. It's going to show your fluid levels, battery charge, all your temperatures. Mower head is now red because it's off. Green will be when it's on. If this flashes here, you have an active code as well as this. If there was an active fault, there'll be a red dot next to one of these. And then this will tell you any active faults. This unit has no faults right now. If you were to hit this button here, it's going to show you log faults. This was a previous uh, fault. So if you were calling us with diagnostic uh, issue, we would ask you to come back to log faults to see if that's a reoccurring event. Starting up. This is your emergency stop. Push down. Kill the engine in case of a rollover. This is a cab pin indicator. If the cab pins were not fully seated, if that is illuminated red, your cab is not properly secured. You have a fuse box in here as well. Fuse locations, amperage are all labeled here on the sticker. Next thing you want to do is start your engine. Set your parking brake immediately when the engine starts. You want to let the unit run. If you want to let the unit run for a minimum of 10 to 15 minutes, Colder weather, let it run for at least a half hour. Get all the fluids warmed up. You 
want to move to your controls. You want to make sure your head lifts. All the functions on your head are working properly. Your flesh is working properly. You move over to your tracks. You push forward. The unit will go forward. Pull backwards. The unit will go backwards. Left. Right. Once your machine is warmed up and you're ready to work, you want to track the unit to a safe area where nobody else is around the unit. You want to turn your head on at idle. Then you want to throttle your machine up. You want to listen to the head. You want to make sure there's no abnormal noises to it. You want to look, feel for any new vibrations. If you feel a vibration, you're going to want to shut the unit down. Make sure there's no material debris build up in the head. You want to lift your head up and down. You move the head in all positions. Again, listening for any noises. Make sure everything is properly operating. to this unit being a high horsepower unit it requires diesel engine fluid the cummins as well as the caterpillar that we have here both require it mm -hmm. on the display screen here we have a depth level gauge the same as with the fuel level gauge what we recommend is when you fuel your unit up you fill your depth tank up as well we don't want to count on this gauge if there was ever anything wrong with it. We just want to make sure this is always filled when the fuel is filled. When you fill this, if the unit does not take a complete container, we recommend you put it in another piece of equipment that calls for DEF or another truck that takes DEF. We do not want to reuse it. Out here is where the def goes. Uh, you have this big metal plate. Pull up and you spin. And then you have your, your def cap. Your def is blue. You know, you don't put diesel in here. You just put def in here. Um, like Evan was saying, you know, every time you fill up the fuel, you want to add new def. A uh, couple things is it's extremely important that this stays clean. Um, before you take this cap off, you want to make sure this is clean. If there's dirt in here, you want to get your air gun out and you want to blow it out really good. But you really can't have any dirt, you know, fall in here as you open this up. If you have dirt and it gets in there, it will trap open some of the valving and the systems, you know, in your def system. And then you won't have a machine that will work. It'll go into D rate um, and it'll put you out of service. So um, this cap here, it's got a lock on it. Um, so you can put a padlock in it. Um, a couple other things as far as best practices with DEF. Uh, like Evan was saying, you never reuse DEF. A lot of times what happens is if you don't use it right away, it starts to uh, crystallize. And then you have all these little white crystals in the cap or in the DEF itself. And same thing, when you get those hard crystals in there, you know, they will... Um, do damage to your DEF system. Uh, a couple other things is make sure that the DEF that you're buying hasn't been sitting around for a while. If you go and buy DEF, buy it from a place that normally sells a lot of DEF so it's constantly turning. It's not just sitting on the shelf uh, for months because DEF has a uh, limited shelf life. You want to make sure that when you're storing the DEF, you're not storing it in the hot sun. You're not leaving it in the, the cab of your hot truck. Um, but you need to be really careful you know, with the DEF so that you don't have any issues uh, with your machine. Right, that was the DEF fill over there with the Cummins engine. Uh, the DEF fill uh, with our Caterpillar engine is actually inside the, uh, the engine compartment on the left side. You know, here's the, um, the fill for the DEF. You know, same, same concerns about the quality of the DEF fluid, but one other concern here, uh, and same concerns too with the dirt. You can see how this machine's had a lot of dirt collect. You can see that the, 
the spill can here has got debris and it's got dirt in it. You want to make sure this stuff is always clean so that when you open the cap, you don't drop the dirt inside there. That's one of the, the most common things here that can put your machine in a D-rate. Uh, but also, when you're working in here, if you spill, the, uh, the def is highly corrosive. All these rubber electrical lines, it'll tear right through these. So if you spill, you want to clean this machine up right away. You want to get the garden hose out. You want to clean it off. You want to get all the def out. If you do spill, this little cup here, this grabs it. So you can take the cup out and then you can drain, drain the cup out, okay? So that you don't have, you know, def uh, in your machine for any long period of time. As we mentioned earlier, at the end of your shift, you want to clean out all the debris in your sprocket areas while it is still wet and easy, easily to be removed. Again, a long spade, skinny spade shovel is the best to get your bigger material out. As you can see, this has been setting in here and is very hard. So using your large spade shovel, you'll go through and get all the big material out. Then you want to start with your pry, then your pry bar. You want to start at the bottom and work your way up so the material follows this clean channel. These are extremely hard because the unit was parked at the end of the shift. These planetaries generate heat and basically bake the mud into place. Keeping up with this at the end of every shift will just make it that much easier the next day. Not cleaning these, as you can see, the material on these sprockets is worn away. They wear faster in the back because they're continuously coming into contact with this hard material. And when a rock gets stuck in here, that's when you can damage these. So these need to be cleaned out at the end of every shift. areas in here as they do not appear to be too dirty, letting this material set here and continuously build up, it's going to be coming into contact with the underside of your track on these pleats here, wearing them out prematurely. So again, just, this is where this spade shovel comes in handy. You want to go down, knock all your trees off. This is a big area here where it collects. You want to get this cleaned out. Work down your frame rail. Then you want to get in here with your front idler. This collects a lot of material as well. Leaving this material in here, it'll get hard, like the dry sprocket area, which in turn will make adjusting your track very difficult the idler will not be able to be retracted to set a track if it ever came off or tensioning it with the competition with all this debris in here. I'm going to be going over proper track tension. With your undercarriage clean, we want to put our mower head on the ground, elevating our machine so the track has room to sag so it's not touching the ground. This is an example of a track that is way too loose. We're using a two by four, which is the easiest gauge. You want an inch and a half of deflection from your third roller back, placing a two by four under your roller. As you can see, this is way too loose. The debris gets in your drive areas. This can lead to the track coming off easier. On this side of the unit, you can see there is no clearance for a 2x4. This track is extremely tight, which in turn will cause damage to your track. On this unit, this is the correct tension where we can easily slide a 2x4 under it with no play in the 2x4 of an inch and a half. This is the correct tension of a track. The visual inspection of the track sag on this side was the side that was extremely loose. You can see 
the amount of sag in this. So if you're walking up to the unit and you saw this before you put your head down, you would know this track is extremely loose. This side of the track is extremely tight. You can see this is banjo tight with absolutely no give in the track. Standing back, you can see the track is extremely taut. A good example of a correctly tensioned track is a slight deflection in it. This track is properly tensioned. This is what you want the track to look like with the unit on the ground. I'm going to go over now how to properly tension a track. As you can see, this one is extremely loose. First thing you want to do is take this access plate off, and half inch socket, root this cover plate. You see a grease fitting in here. You put your grease gun on there. Have your block ready. Start tensioning it. What this does is there's a tensioner in here, pushes it forward. Have your block setting in here. Bring it to your proper tension. You want to keep in mind that if you're using a battery operated grease gun, the grease is going to come out that much faster. Just be conscientious of that so you're not over tensioning it. If you did over tension it, you would take out this plug here, stand on the track, it'll push the grease out of the tensioner, and then you can go back to reset it to the proper tension. Show you how to release tension on a track that is over tensioned. You want to remove the cover plate here to access the plug. You're going to want to remove this entire plug. I need a 7 8 socket. Remove this plug. Stand on the track. Bounce on. Relieve the pressure. You can see the grease is coming out. What that's doing is you're pulling the tensioner in. Take your gauge block, make sure you're at your inch and a half. Reinstall your plug, reinstall your access plate. If we have not brought the tracks both sides to the correct tension, the unit will not be able to drive straight. It could go to one direction or the other, as well as if you have mixed match tracks on. One side may be more aggressive or taller, leading to the machine not being able to track in a straight line. We're now going to look inspect our tracks for damages. You're going to check the other side of your track for any cuts, tears, pieces of rubber missing. With our track being as loose as it was here, we have the risk of the track derailing. When this happens, your drive sprocket is not in the cleat, cleated area. That sprocket will run on the inside of the track here, causing excessive wear. If this happens, you want to shut your machine off and reset your track. When we're driving over stumps or sharp objects, we recommend you avoid them. If you cannot avoid them, you want to drive straight over them with no turning, slowly. While we're looking at our tracks, we want to look at all of our undercarriage components and mounting hardware. We want to look at all our rollers. Make sure all our roller bolts are in on the outside. When you're on one side of the machine, you want to look through this opening here. Check all your inside bolts. Make sure they're all there. 
move over to your final drives, your sprockets. You want to make sure all your sprocket bolts are present and secure. You want to look at your sprockets themselves. Make sure all the teeth are here. Make sure there's no large damage or cracks. Your tracks. You want to look for tears, large pieces of material. Now this is a puncture more than likely from a rock. This will be okay because it's in this tread and the thickness of the tread. You want to really be looking in between them and on the underside. If you start seeing metal cords in here, you know that the track eventually will fail, leaving you stranded in the woods potentially. You want to make sure when you do see one of these with the metal cord showing, you have a track ready to be installed. You may get six months on a tear. You may get six days on a tear. It all depends on the terrain and the operation. I'm going to be going over how to replace a track due to it derailing an operation or if you had to put a new set of tracks on. The first thing you want to do is remove your access plate. Pull this plug out. The easiest thing to do is to use your head. You can get a block of wood. You go in the woods, cut down yourself a small sapling, put it in between your head and your track, roll it back. That'll take your tensioner, move your tensioner back, pushing the grease out. You want this fully collapsed. Once you do that, you're going to get yourself, if you had some blocks of wood, or again, you can get yourself a couple sections of a tree, something significant. Stick under the rear of the machine, not under the belly pan. When you put it under the machine, you want to have it tight to where you can physically put it in. You want to take your head, push your head down, and that'll lift your machine off the ground. You want roughly three inches of play here because with the track being loose, it's gonna come in contact with the ground. You may have to readjust your, uh, your cribbing. <clears throat> Once you do that, you're gonna come back to your final drives. You're gonna run a brief move three of these. 15, 16 socket. You want to have them oriented to where they will slide right out. So you'll have to take these straps out. So you would take these out, clear back into your next seg segment. Somebody in the machine, you're going to direct them until your next segment is clear of the track. Having in this area, having yourself away from the machine, no fingers or tools in this area. So your operator will advance it again, get your next segment in, remove it. Have your operator move the track again forward, that your last segment in, the, in this open area, not in contact with your track. If the track is derailed, you want to set the track back on the front eyelid first. The best way to do that is get yourself a long pry bar, a shale bar will work. Putting it in between the cleats and the track, and walking it over. Work yourself around, get this back on your front idler. Then you can move back to your sprocket. This segment that we have in the clear position, we want to run around and get it back into your cleats. You may have to work the track forward or backwards to get it lined up. That track then, that, that sprocket then is set in your sprocket. You'll now catch your track, bring it around, and you'll have an open window again, but your next segment. Again, keep walking it forward. Put your next segment in. Once all your segments are seated in your track, you're good to go. 
put your grease plug back in. Your machine is already up in the air. Have your 254 gauge block ready. Retention your track. Another important part, before you put your segments back on, you want to make sure the back side of your segment is clean and the front of the hub on the planetary is clean. So they have a flush mounting surface. You want to also make sure that your straps are in place. And a little hint to make life easier, mark the sprockets. One with one, two, two, three with three. So all your bolt holes line up. These have different bolt patterns, and you'll be fighting them. Your machine's going to collect a lot of debris just from the nature of what it's doing. So you want to make sure that you get the debris you know, off the machine every day. You can see here on the mower head, we've got some some wood here. A lot of it gets packed in here. Um, so about once a week, you want to take these plates off and, and fish the dirt out. Same thing, you know, with the mower over here. Um, right here where the, the door opens and closes in this rubber, this whole section here gets full of dirt. We've been taking out trash cans full of dirt before just by pulling these bolts out. But if you look over here, you know, one of the most important parts is these pivot points. You can see here how the wood gets stuck in all these points here. And you can see all the extra wear and tear here. And sometimes when you have too much stuff in here and you curl back the head, it actually can bend the cylinders, get the cylinders to leak. Um, sometimes it can get caught up here in the hoses and when you move the loader's arms up and down, then the hoses can't move and flex the way that they're supposed to. They get stuck, they get pinched, they leak, and that's when you're replacing hoses. So you want to take your, your air nozzle and you want to be blowing all this stuff out. But you can see why it's so important to have a good air compressor because so much debris kind of builds up. So you want to get in all these pivot points where you don't have any damage and all these pivot points in here. Get in here in the glass so your wiper doesn't scratch your glass up too much. Uh, and then you're going to kind of go around your machine. Um, you want to blow out all of this area here. You can see that there's a lot of debris that builds up on top of the, the engine compartment. Um, this machine actually, believe it or not, isn't, isn't too bad. It's got some debris in some of the right places, but we've seen machines just packed. You know, that's for the sort of thing when you get stuff back in some of these areas that um, is, is fuel for, for fire. So we want to make sure that every day we're getting the debris out of there so it doesn't build and it's great. Okay, once you're done cleaning up top here, and up top it's really important because there's some cooling lines that are hot um, and there's some exhaust up here that's hot and those are all things that could ignite fire. You want to come down here and you want to pay special attention to um, the cooling pack. You know, this machine's got to breathe. Uh, and the temperature of the hydraulic system is, is hot. Um, the cooler you can keep the hydraulic fluid, the longer the hydraulic fluid is going to last, the more productive the machine is going to be, and the longer all these components that are being lubricated by the hydraulic fluid, you know, they're going to last. Um, so right here, um, this is a waffle screen. The reason we've got this waffle screen with the peaks and valleys is because if you stretch it out, it'll probably be quite a bit bigger than it is here. So it gives you a lot more surface area. So if it's less likely to get clogged. And you can see how just small these little holes are. Um, but what I usually do is I'll take my glove and I'll come down through here and take all the heavy stuff off with my glove. Um, I don't like to shoot this side of it because I don't want to shoot the material in. So I take it with my glove off first. You can see these small holes. And then you can see on this side the holes get a little bit bigger. And then you can see on this side the, uh, the fins of your core for your radiator or even bigger. So the, the thought process is if something's small enough to make it through these two screens, it's going to blow, you know, right through here. So then I take my glove and I kind of clean this side and then I take my, my, uh, my airline here and I blow it all out this direction. Then what I do is I kind of take a look here and I get my flashlight and I kind of go through the whole thing and I look to see which one of my fins are plugged up. A lot of times what you'll see is you'll see that your corners here, 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 and your center, they're the ones usually clogged up because the fan is keeping it clean here. But I'll go and I'll find my spots and I, this is why we take our rubber tip nozzle because with your nozzle you're kind of going fin by fin by fin by fin, checking with your light, kind of going fin by fin by fin, but you want to blow your debris all the way through. And as you're doing it, you want to be careful that you don't damage it. But I like to 
clean this screen off, you know, once a day, open it up. And if this is dirty, you know, and I'm working in a real dirty area, I'll hit this once a day. But usually once a week, I'm going through here fin by fin. You do that and your machine's going to last a lot longer and keep going a lot longer. So you've got some cooling packs down here, but on this machine, they get this purpose built, and you've got a lot more coolant running through here, a lot more hydraulic fluid running through it. So you've got a lot more capacity. So you have these screens here that Evan's taken out, and these are washer screens too. And you can see here, you know, with these screens, same thing. You have a, a bigger area, smaller holes. And uh, what I like to do is I like to blow these in reverse. So I'll get on the one side and, and blow them out, uh, you know, opposite from the way that it's pulling up. I'll get on the other side and, and push through it. And then you can see there you got a radiator. So I like to get up in here with my, my nozzle. And I like to clean this out the best I can so you can see all this area here. And the nice thing about it is you can get it from the, from the ground level. At the end of the day, while you're cleaning your machine off, let's go through the mower head. Make sure all your mounting hardware is present and secure. You're also going to be wanting to look at your teeth. Not missing any carbines. Not worn to the point where they're getting into your holder. Ninety percent of the time, you're mowing with the center of your unit, concentrating on your big material. Your center teeth will work wear faster than your outside. Keep the balance of the unit. If it was getting a vibration, you want to rotate the teeth. You take your outside, your center teeth, move them to your outside, vice versa, and have them even. You don't want all your worn teeth on one side of the drum. That will throw the balance off. You want them consistent throughout the drum. You can flip these teeth two times by removing these two bolts. It's 15, 16 you're going to need. Loosen both of them. Never hold the tooth. Once you take one out, you loosen the other one, the tooth can spin. Tension your hand in here. Drop your tooth off. You want to go to your tooth holder. These two areas in here where the tooth seats. You take a screwdriver, clean that debris out. The bottom side as well. Take yourself a good stiff wire brush, clean them up, as well as your mating surface. You want to have all these areas where the tooth comes into contact clean. as well as these areas. If you're flipping it, have this face clean, and these two areas in here clean, so they seat. These bolts come with a washer. They're concave. You want the concave up, so as you're tightening it, that acts as at your lock washer, pushes that down, keeping the bolt secure. You want to have a torque wrench, as we mentioned earlier, that goes to 220 foot pounds. You want to torque your teeth to 220 foot pounds. You want to get yourself a marker, mark your bolts so you don't miss any. Go throughout the entire drum. You can use these teeth two times. If it's damaged or worn, flip it, secure it. Other side gets worn, damaged, the tooth is no good. These bolts you cannot use. Two times you can use these. After that, they're garbage. A good example of a damaged tooth, you never want to let your tooth get to this condition. You start wearing this holder out, you take material from your drum, which in turn will lead to the drum being off balance. inspecting your drum you also want to check all your welds on your holders any cracks in the welds the unit should be put out of service until repaired you can throw one of these holders if it hits someone or something it'll be bad you want to check your anvil and your anvil wear strips 
make sure they're all secure, they have welds, and they're all present. All your mounting hardware for your tree deflector. And your wear skids. Make sure they're all present. I'm going to go over proper mounting of the mower head to the unit. You want to make sure this red safety bar is in place. This keeps your lock handles in place. With this, They will not be able to open with this bar properly secure. You want to make sure your hardware, two bolts in here, are present and secure. You also want to make sure your mounting bolts from the plate to the head are secure. These are not secure with the vibration of the head. These can work loose, causing them to move, taking your thread out, and then you will not be able to replace the bolt. We're going to be going over greasing now and inspection of your loader arms, your loader pins. In the cab here, we have a grease chart. It'll have an hourglass that's going to call for when it needs to be greased. Below that, there'll be a grease gun, and it's going to say a number, and that's how many pumps you're going to want to put to it. Anywhere there's a moving part on the machine, a pivoting area is going to be a grease fitting. You have four in the back against the unit. On the bottom on your curl cylinders. On top, on your side, and here. And then on your mower head, you're gonna have two. We recommend you use a manual grease gun on the mower head bearing so you don't over grease them. You can use a battery operated one. What's nice about this, I can put it in a low speed and you can actually count the clicks. This needs to be greased twice a day at lunchtime and at the end of the shift. What this is going to do is going to push your old grease out, allow fresh grease in here. This is spinning extremely fast. Where's the grease out? We want to keep this full of fresh grease. While we're in here greasing and we're either pumping or listening for this, giving us the number of pumps, we want to be looking around, make sure all our securement pins are in place, secure. We're looking at weldment, making sure nothing's cracked. We're looking at our cylinders, making sure there's no leaks. Anywhere our hydraulic lines become intact, that there's no chafing. And this will all be greased when you finish your daily cleanup. Just to allow you to get to those areas. We're going to be greasing this at lunch because the unit has been running for a half a day. All our joints are warm and free. We want to do it at the end of our shift, after cleanup, so the unit is ready for the next day. When it's cold out, nothing, the ports can be plugged, you bite and pull in zerk fittings out, cleaning them, you know, you can spend 20 minutes and still not get it. That way we say do it at lunch, the machine's been running, everything's loose. Seamalt head has two grease fittings as well on the other side of your drum. These will take 20 pumps. Again, with a battery power grease gun, most of them in the low speed, you'll be able to hear it clicking giving that pump with grease out or a manual grease gun. You want to use a good high temp grease that doesn't break down. Grease is cheap. You want to be using a minimum of three tubes of grease a week. It's a lot cheaper than replacing a bearing.
again, why I'm producing the machine so is the other one. Go through all your mounting hardware, your hoses, weld it, and it shows no damages. Okay, I'm going to show you how to put the, uh, the cab up. Um, once a week, you're going to want to put the cab up so that you can get underneath of it with your air gun and kind of blow out the debris that collects under the cab. Uh, once a month, you're going to put the cab up to flush it out. Uh, when we flush it out, we um, take the belly pans out and just do a really good, good cleaning. Uh, a couple things to think about before you uh, tilt the cab. Um, first thing is you, don't want to make, you want to make sure you don't have anything on the floor of the cab or behind the seat because when you tilt the cab it can come up and, and smash the, the front window. Another thing is, is um, that the mower head has to be all the way down so it's out of the way for the cab when it opens and then this door it has to be closed. If you don't have these three things in that place then it won't uh, go up and over. Before you start moving the cab go to the other side on the door on the inside of the door and grab the safety strap because this is a safety strap for your cab to kind of hold it up in the air uh, in case you're, you know, working on the cab and it'll come down on you. So over here are the controls. Um, and you have a, an up and you have a down. So first thing that happens when you hold the up is you have two locking pins. Uh, so these locking pins hydraulically are going to pull in on both sides. So right now the hydraulic pin on the other side is pulling in and in a second here you're going to see that other pin there pull out. Once the pins pull all the way in, then the cab's going to start tilting hydraulically automatically. Um, it's nice that it's um, automatic, that it's uh, moving under control, um, and that it's tethered in so that it can't go over center. Uh, grab your safety strut. It goes like this. This tab right here is for the top. So once the cab is all the way up, you can take this piece and you put it inside the cylinder and you lock it right there. You can either leave it like that or if you'd like you can drop it down so that it's just sitting on the safety strut. So now you can get in here with your air gun and you can clean this whole area out. Um, if you want to rinse it without removing the belly plans, you can. If you look down here, if you're going to do that, you want to make sure that these are clean out, that these aren't stuck with mud. If those are open like that, then you should be able to rinse it out with the belly pans on. But sometimes when that gets really packed with mud, you pull the belly pans off, and then you take your, your hose and you wash and rinse it out. But again, about once a month, you want to rinse that out. So the opposite to get it down is you've got to go up to get the safety strut out. Once that safety strut is fully clear, you can pull your safety strut out. And then you want to hit your down button. And you're going to bring it all the way down. And when it comes down, the two pins are going to go out through these two holes. And then what we're looking for over here is this green light. This actually says rear cab pins are latched when indicator is lit. So we'll give it a moment here. It'll probably take a minute. But we'll watch this go all the way down. And um, you want to make sure that you give it enough time because it takes a little while for the pins to come out for this green light to come on and you don't want to stop until that green light's on for a few seconds uh, otherwise you'll get in the machine and the cab will be you know moving up and down because it's not secured all the way um, these are big heavy pins and it does take a, a moment for them to come in but any second here we should probably start seeing this pin come through and once the pin comes through you want to come, come over here and watch for your green light and I hold it down for a couple seconds just to be sure. And now we know that our cab is down and secure. Here's our machine with uh, a couple thousand hours on it. Uh, it's not too bad. Um, it's certainly at a point where it should be clean. But this is typically what you'll see at the end of, you know, one week's worth of operation. You can see all the dust and the debris and the debris build up here between the cab and the engine compartment. But down below, this is where my, my primary concerns are, and this is where you really want to rinse it out good. You can see the dirt and debris kind of on that um, belly pan. And then if you look back at those metal 
uh, and rubber uh, electric lines and hydraulic hoses. You can see you're, you're really starting to bury the stuff down there. What happens is is that holds the moisture in and then those, um, those rubber lines, whether they're electric or hydraulic, they start to dry rot. Um, and of course the electrics then, uh, you have problems with your electrics with corrosion and then your rubber lines start to get cracks in them and that's how you get your, your leaks. And of course as all these lines are moving around, as the machine's moving around, if you had the dirt and the sand in there, that's when you have the chafing and that's when you have um, your leaks. So to prevent your leaks, you know, let's keep your belly pans clean. That's about everything that the operator and the crew should do to care for the machine between our, our visits every three months. Um, those are the things that you're going to want to do daily, uh, weekly, uh, monthly, um, really so that your machine is, is running the best that it can. Uh, you can pick up 20% you know, you know, more productivity with a, a machine that's running the way that it should compared to a machine that you know, needs service, needs maintenance, needs little things like, you know, air filters cleaned out. Um, as much as we do, though, and as much as we want to do this so that we prevent breakdowns, we're, we're still going to have breakdowns. You know, it's steel and hydraulics. It, it's going to war with the woods every day for the nature of what it does. That's why it takes its specialized care. So when you have the breakdowns, um, you're going to always want to call your company first, you know, check in with them on the breakdown, and then call us. Um, and we'll do what we can. A lot of times if you've got the code, the trouble code, um, from how we showed you to pull the trouble code earlier in the video, we'll be able to tell you exactly what you need to do. Uh, and we're so used to seeing these trouble codes that we can tell you oftentimes right where the wire is that frayed that needs to be repaired so that you can, you can keep on running. So sometimes um, we're going to be close enough um, as we're out visiting all 48 states on a pretty regular basis that we'll be able to dispatch somebody, one of the guys that sees these machines every day to work on it. Sometimes we'll have to walk you through it over the phone. Sometimes we'll get to a, a local repair shop and we'll, we'll tell them exactly what to do. We'll expedite the parts and we'll follow through and make sure it's been done right. But one way or the other, we're, we're here for you. You know, our job is, is to give you the best experience that we can um, by giving you the most amount of uptime that we can. These are Great machines, they're, they're purpose built. You know, we've been selling this model for the last you know, 10 years. We've got a few hundred of them out there that we take care of and we, we really believe in it. And it's done a lot of work on the, the right of ways, uh, distribution, transmission, and a lot of other mowing for, for a long time. And, um, it really has a proven track record of success. So, yeah, give us a call and we'll help you out however we need to. Thank you.